Okay, welcome to the Municipality of South Dundas Council meeting with this team for Monday, March 13th, 2023. Uh, I'll recall this meeting to order as we reconvene from a closed session that was called to order at 5.30. Uh, item number three on the ad agenda is confirmation of agenda. Any additions, deletions, or amendments to the agenda? Seeing none, move to item four, disclosure of pecuniary interest and the general nature thereof. Seeing none, we'll move to number five, adoption of minutes. We have two meeting minutes to approve from February the 13th, 2023, regular meeting, and February 22nd, 2023, a special meeting. I have a motion that these minutes uh, be adopted as circulated. Councillor Ward, seconded by Councillor Smith. All in favor? Carried. Okay, moving into items number six, delegations. Our first delegation tonight is uh, Jane Scones is here from Community Food, Food Share. Go ahead, Thank you, Jane. Jean uh, Schoons from Community Food Chair. I'm the team leader, uh, and we serve Dundas and Stormont County. Our mission is to provide our neighbors with access to healthy food by promoting the benefits of nutrition, building community partnerships, and supporting clients through a variety of life challenges. Our vision is that no person or family in our community goes hungry. Community Food Chair has served Dundas and Stormont counties for over 30 years. Formerly, we were known as the Dundas County Food Bank. There's a big disconnect, <laughs> unfortunately, that people do not hear food bank in our name and do not realize that that's what we do and who we are. CFS is a member of Food Banks Canada, Feed Ontario, Food Banks United, the Good Food Organization, and recently we've joined Second Harvest. As a small nonprofit governed by an active board of directors, we have nine to 11 board of directors, three part-time staff, and a full-time administrator, and a large volunteer, uh, dedicated volunteers that keep us moving and going. Um, we're a small but mighty team is what I like to call us. Uh, our coordinator is Amy Saunders. Uh, she's a resident of South Dundas and has been with us for 10 years. Originally, she was our coordinator here in Morsper, but she now also oversees the Winchester Food Bank and our satellite locations. We have site attendants, Jill Roberts, who's here in Morsburg, and Angie Holmes, who's in Winchester, and they work 12 hours over two weeks or an average of six hours a week. Um, they cover the office depending on where uh, Amy is. So Amy might be in Morrisburg, then the site attendant would be in Winchester. Uh, it's very important for us to have staff on site so that we can guide our team and uh, have somebody in the chair at all times. We're extremely thankful for the many, many volunteers that are part of Community Food Share because they're the backbone. Um, as I said, we're a very small team, and without the volunteers, we wouldn't be able to do everything that we can do for the community. We uh, also appreciate the volunteers who share their gift of time during food drives, fundraisers, events. Hey, can you pick this up? Those types of things. Um, it's, it, we just wouldn't be able to do what we do without that core community support. As team leader, I manage the administration side of Community Food Share, uh, overseeing food drives that people in the community say, hey, we'd like to do this, can you help us? Um, and give them packages, et cetera, events, communications, volunteer recruitment, partnerships, outreach, and coming to speak to councils to tell everybody who we are. Our primary service continues to be health choice and client choice. Operating Morrisburg Food Bank, which is, if everybody knows where the arena is, we're at 28 Ottawa Street, we're downstairs, and Winchester at 497 May Street, and we have food satellite in Finch that's open weekly. We also had the Williamsburg satellite that we thought would make it a little bit easier that for people who couldn't come all the way to Morrisburg. We had one person attend, so we are reevaluating that at the moment. Anyone living in Dundas or Stormont, facing food insecurity can call us. It's as simple as that. The process is confidential and it's easy. During the appointment, the clients meet with our staff for a short intake interview. Uh, this information is confidential and used for statistical information by Food Banks Canada and Feed Ontario. We ask for proof of address, information on each individual residing at the address so we can best serve their dietary needs. An example might be, we want to know if there's a baby in the house, if we need to provide formula or diapers or children for snacks for school, or if there's special diets and even pets. Because if you're facing food insecurity, you might have pets and they need food as well. 
Um, staff share information about other CFS programs, local partner programs and services that are beneficial. Following the intake interview, volunteers assist the client with shopping by reading their uh, shopping list. Their individual list is made specifically for each family. Community Food Chair's shopping lists were compiled with the assistance of the Eastern Ontario Health Unit um, a dietitian to ensure that we have a seven to nine day supply for each family member according to Canada Food Guide. Our food orders include milk, eggs, yogurt, cheese, bread, fresh produce, as well as frozen meat, vegetables, juice, and non-perishables. There's still that stigma that when we do a food drive, we ask for non-perishables. Somebody gave us an eggplant when we did fill a bag last year. It didn't really look like anything by the time we got to it. So that's why we asked for non-perishables. There are some exceptions to, um, to these food drives. For example, uh, at the Iroquois food land, when the lines do a food drive, we might include potatoes, carrots, onions, because we know that food is dropped off that day and we're not sorting through hundreds of bags. Um, at that time. The client choice model allows for the shopper to choose what they prefer on their shelves. So if they're allowed to take four cans of soup, for example, depending on their family size, they can choose. If you hate mushroom soup, somebody giving you mushroom soup isn't very fair. <laughs> um, so you have a choice. There might be a brand that you like. And all depending, thankfully we're back to food drives, we have variety. Uh, during COVID, we were very fortunate to get some funding, so we weren't buying nine different types. Um, so there's a lot more variety with our food at this moment in time. Clients can also access additional supports through Community Food Share. We have our Community Volunteer Income Tax Program, which runs year-round. It's really important because a lot of people, whether it's literacy or intimidation or whatever the reason or rationale is, may not have done their income tax for a number of years and they might be missing out on all types of benefits, especially if they have young children, tax child and uh, uh, OAS, any of those types of things, um, you need your ta income tax done. So that runs year round by our volunteers. Uh, we have advocates that, can, that connect, uh, our staff are wonderful, but we also have advocates in the community. Uh, our advocate in South Dundas is Pat Martin to help clients if they need to bridge um, into social services or to reach out. Um, we have other partner programs. For example, we have um, with BMR, House of Lazarus, at Christmas programs in South Dundas. Um, we have those partner programs so that we can provide outside sources. Um, and by that partnership, it makes, makes it a little bit easier because then we have the volume that we can purchase for heat for the holidays, for example. We provide a client update newsletter uh, throughout the year. During COVID, it was almost monthly, but now uh, just to ensure that when people need 211 or any of those resources, they know how, they have it on a sheet at home. Um, but it's also oral history because we have some people that might visit us that have um, literacy issues. So we try to accommodate however we can. We work closely with the Christmas uh, basket program, uh, snowsuit registration, date and times. We also are able to provide House of Lazarus vouchers to clients a couple of times a year if they need it. And we also have pa uh, partnered with a group that donates backpacks for homeless. Community Food Share does not receive provincial or federal uh, government funding. Our funding comes from community partners, grants, fundraising, food drives, and donations from individuals, businesses, and organizations. Annually, we as a group hold annual events. And this year I was excited that we could actually do all of them. <laughs> uh, in February we have empty bowls. I'm not sure if any of you are aware of it. But that's a main fundraiser that's held in Williamsburg. Um, it's basically soup and entertainment and brings in money for us. Uh, we have fill a bag which is in May and that will be held again this May. Uh, all bags are donated, 5,000 bags will be donated throughout Dundas and Stormont, dropped off at different households on the first Saturday of May and picked up the following Saturday in May. Hopefully the bags will be filled and sitting on the front porch. Um, la this year we are also, we launched a spring raffle calendar um, and that those tickets will be sold in North and South Dundas and in Stormont. And it gives people an opportunity to win every day the month of May and it's also a very good fundraiser for us to bring in some income. Um, Winchester Bike Night last year, uh, we were able to do 50-50 draws on the night and uh, 
we did very well because we had the opportunity to sell tickets from the Friday after the previous month's bike night, and we sold $2,000 in tickets prior to that evening, so we made about $2,000. Um, and I guess we did something right. We're invited now to go back and collect food every bike night, every third Thursday of the months of my summer. <laughs> um, but that's, it's exciting, and uh, it's another education piece to get out in the community. In November, we have Stuff a Cruiser, which happens in North and South uh, Dundas. It happens here at Lord's Valley Mart. CP Holiday Train happens in Stormont. It's a food drive and donation drive. And uh, we also have a lot of uh, community gardens where we ask people to grow an extra row for the food bank so we can provide that fresh produce. One of the things I'm very excited about, um, when I came on board in 2019, we had a partnership garden in Winchester with St. Paul's Church. And uh, all the produce from the church comes to, uh, the church garden comes to Community Food Share. So it's divided between all of our locations as well. Uh, the year, two years ago, Finch Garden Boxes started, and so now we have more produce. Um, and then last year, Iroquois, uh, the Presbyterian Church, the Lions and, and Gardeners partnered, and we received wonderful bounty of fresh produce that way. Um, so that means that our clients in every corner and every part of our food bank uh, system gets a lot of fresh fruit and, and product. Um, in the fall, we also have been always invited to glean the gardens at Upper Canada Village. And last year, we had a bumper crop. We received 1,000 pounds in late September. Uh, but it also allowed for the first time that we had pumpkins for every child that visited the food bank, which was a real bonus. Um, as a member of Feed Ontario, our membership uh, food allocation, such as eggs, milk, chicken, pork, beef, and turkeys, depending, they have partnerships with all the agricultural federations and suppliers, so it'll be nothing unusual that all of a sudden, out of nowhere, a truckload of turkeys will show up <laughs> on a Thursday <laughs> afternoon, but that means we can play that forward to our clientele. I also mentioned that we are a member of Second Harvest. Second Harvest is a uh, food rescue uh, organization, and we signed up with them in Winchester initially. Um, we have a terrible problem. We have too much meat. We cannot get rid of the frozen meat that we have because we're giving clients two and three times what we could before, um, but they don't have the refrigeration or freezer space. Um, that was a problem that staff brought to me that I just don't see how that's a problem. So we're able to provide a lot more protein to our clientele. And uh, over the past few months, Laura's uh, Value Mart here in Morrisburg has come on board. So we are receiving a plethora of other items, uh, it's not just meat. So um, anybody that needs food, we have food and we're available to help. Um, I'd like to thank you all on behalf of the board of directors and the staff and the clients uh, for your generous time and uh, hope that you feel that you have a better understanding of who we are, what we do and how we do it. Uh, I do believe that you all have a pamphlet in front of you. I apologize to the Deputy Mayor, it's kind of long distance. <laughs> uh, this is kind of my Communications Committee's pride and joy because there was a pamphlet that looked like it was photocopied uh, many, many moons ago and the information wasn't accurate. Um, the picture on the front of this is an actual shopping cart for a family of four. Um, and uh, you don't see the cans because most of them are below. Uh, uh, it, it's an, an overview of what you would typically get when you come to Community Food Share. Um, we wanted to make this brochure uh, very clear to everybody and anybody and easy to spot um, because we want people to know that we're, the, we're your food bank and we're here to help. And if you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to try to answer them. Oh, well, that's, that's great, Team Leader Schoons. I uh, appreciate your time. Uh, certainly, since I attended the Food Share event with Feed Ontario on December the 9th, I have shared a couple times during our council meetings some of the work you've done and some of the other groups that you're involved with. So we're certainly very appreciative of, of the work you do uh, for our community and for the volunteers. And, and please pass that on from, mm -hmm. from our team, from us here, of all the residents that uh, uh, are supporting other residents. So, so thank you for that. Um, I, did, I did mention around the Christmas time that uh, obviously that could be a, a, a bigger use but also a bigger donation time. One of the questions I had, is there certain times of year that's more challenging than others for your uh, mm, no. food share? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, all, it's always challenging, I'm sure. But I well, it, it is always challenging and I had a conversation today with uh, Amy, our coordinator, and um, she was in a bit of a panic because our numbers have drastically increased over the past weeks 
Um, our numbers have always sort of stayed steady. Numbers went down during COVID when people were misplaced because of housing, and now there are people coming left, right, and center. Um, so at this time of year, it's, it's really quite difficult for us because we're in between seasons, if that makes any sense. Our big fill bag is in May, and the, we collect all the non-perishables at that time, which generally brings us to early end of September. Um, so we just have to purchase certain items. And then the giving season starts in October <laughs> until right. the end of December. Unfortunately, not many people think of the food bank in January, February, March, or April. So it, I would say the spring is, is just a tide over because there are no gardens and, and I think everybody's kind of hibernating at this time sure. of year. So I, I would say at this time of year. So maybe that's something we could participate in to get the word out that now is a good time of uh, year to uh, mm -hmm. contribute to the we, community food share, uh, yeah, we would the really whole system in that. the area. So Well, yes, and because we have this brochure, we also have a digital copy that I'll be asking if you could post it on your social media as well. And we're hoping to do a blitz in the next little bit to try to get the word out to let people know that we're here to help. And if people want to help us, we'll appreciate that because it's a win-win for all of us. Any other questions or comments? From the council team? Councillor Ward. Uh, th thank you. Uh, I think all the work you guys do is fabulous and I really appreciate everything you do for our community, especially for those who are having a hard time. So I, I really do extend my thank you. Um, I guess the question I have, is there any particular items that you guys are short on that you would appreciate over other items? I know you said non-perishables you're not really looking for at this time, but mm -hmm. is there anything that we could encourage people to give? Or? The best thing, uh, the best plan to do that would be to contact the food bank directly okay. and contact Amy Saunders, who's our coordinator, and she can be reached at the food bank or uh, via her email, which is in here, it's coordinator at Community Food Chair. Her information's in here as well, because she knows what's on the shelves at all locations. It's amazing how She's right on top of that. And she could say, yeah, we're desperate for this item or that item. I know that when I was in Winchester last week, volunteers were saying, we need condiments. <laughs> and I'm thinking, okay, pass it on to, to Amy. But uh, she knows what we need at the moment. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Okay. Well, thank you very much for coming tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Okay, next on our agenda, uh, 6B, Dundas County Archives, we have uh, Susan Peters here with us tonight as we change up positions at the microphone. Welcome, Susan. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. I have a PowerPoint, but oh, there it is. Okay. We have it on screen. We have screen. it. Okay. So since uh, essentially we have a new council, I figured it would probably be a good idea to do a, a very brief uh, overview of what the archives is and where we started. Uh, it's a fairly new organization actually since um, 2016 was when the first steps were made. I was brought in 2017 to find a location and to help with the sourcing of things like shelving. Uh, we weren't actually open to the public until 2019 so um, fairly recent but um, I'm personally feel that we've accomplished quite a bit in that time period and now especially with the newspaper digitization project it, it's out there that the archives exist so it's kind of a double-edged sword because that means you have a lot more interest but then it also means you get more materials so that's how it works okay so how am I advancing this? Arrows. Arrow. No. okay that didn't work Oh, there we go. Okay, so yeah, I covered most of that stuff. Um, uh, another thing that, that has come up is the St. Lawrence branch, the United Empire Loyalists, the Family Research Center is in the same building, but they are a separate entity. And that seems to be a constant thing, people wanting to make appointments with me for them. So at some point, we'll, maybe the public will figure this out, maybe we'll figure this out, but uh, for now, we operate separately. So. Uh, the core mission of the Dundas County Archives, like every, every organization has a, a mission statement. Bloody boring stuff, but <laughs> it's important. Uh, but basically, as a municipal archive, or a county archive, our first important base of mission is to be 
the records keeper for both North Dundas and South Dundas. And then what has developed from that is we are also now collecting materials from the municipalities, various different organizations, uh, groups, family history, uh, businesses, anything along that line that, that helps to describe and preserve the history of, of both North and South Dundas. So that's basically that. Um, I said that already. Uh, we have in the picture is just an example of some of the newspapers that have come in. Um, they were in pretty dire situation, but when you look at these are records that don't exist anywhere else, so it was important to preserve them. Um, it meant that I had spent a lot of time piecing things together, and uh, I don't think I'll ever need to do a puzzle again for the rest of my life, but it was something that had to be done. And um, as far as looking at, oh yeah, I was so excited about the fact that we had uh, two cold case murder cases that I put it up there more than once, but um, just to show that our, the, the purpose of the archive is not just municipal records, we also serve uh, like I said, the OPP, there's been uh, newspaper reporters, there's been television reporters, there's been people working on master's thesis, several of them. Um, I've had the odd contact from university professors, although sometimes when they come on a Friday afternoon, I think it's to solve a bet, you know, who is the, who is the local um, provincial legislature member on a certain date, so but we still answer those things. Uh, over the years, I've also had people, uh, family members of those who are related to various different increment rockets. Uh, so we're building a collection of that. Um, and I mean, they're actually, the increment rockets are actually in the, uh, uh, the National Hockey Hall of Fame. So, you know, it's kind of significant history. Um, I go to the grocery store and people find me and, and have things to donate to me, so uh, sometimes I find them at my house. Ideally, it should go to the archives, and you, there is a process by which you appraise things and decide whether this is important and it can be kept, not necessarily handed to you in the grocery store, but yeah, it's a small town. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, so the primary records are the municipal archives, uh, municipal records, but we've also been lately collecting things to do with fairs. Um, basically, any time that anybody has gotten together in history and collected some form of records, um, that is something that would be of, of interest to the, to the archives. Uh, also lately, and I think this also comes from the newspaper digitization project. I've had a lot of people who found in their attics or their basements either photos of houses being moved or um, destroyed during the Seaway project. A lot of documents, a lot of engineering documents to do with the Seaway project have all come just in the last few months. Um, and I think during the COVID period when a lot of people were shut into their house, they started going through things. and. Um, it is amazing how much material is out there about the seaway. It's uh, so slowly all coming in. Uh, another example of, this is the Mooresburg Courier in the picture. Um, it was in pretty dire shape too, but we fixed that. Uh, the newspaper paper digitization project was essentially two years long, uh, basically due to funding from the United Counties Council, which was very generous. Um, it, it, the project was a joint effort for the um, Glengarry Archives, Lost Villages Historical Society, and the Dundas County Archives. And so the, the funds that came from the United Counties Council was split three ways. They hired an organization called Image Advantage, and for two years my life was putting together newspapers, um, piecing together them, gathering them. Sometimes I went to people's barns and had to get past their Dobermans to prove that I was worthy and such, but we did manage to get them. Organized them, collected them. We have about 250,000 pages that have been digitized, but as often is the case, uh, we ran out of budget before we ran out of newspapers. So I'm still trying to find other sources, uh, possible grants, 
problem is that most of the grants programs are um, only qualify not for profits. And uh, as a municipal archive, we don't qualify that, but it's still looking for it. But the biggest thing is that um, by having done this, we have preserved records that are found nowhere else. You can find some of this information in local newspapers that you will not be able to find anywhere. Like I said, there have been two cold burner cases that I've actually helped to solve because of what was in newspapers. Um, so it's important stuff. And what is really important is the fact that due to this funding, this material is all searchable free of charge for anyone. And this is very well disclosed out there. And as of about a month ago, uh, it's now linked to uh, Archeon, which is a Ontario Archivist Association's um, uh, database. And so that means that it, it goes even further. So even more people are able to access. I've actually had calls from people from far away as Denmark who have seen this. And some of the, some of the um, search capability is a little bit defective because of the fact that these old papers were put together. So sometimes they'll call me and say, I can't, I can't see this as well, this particular issue in 1904. Can you, can you help me with it? So, I mean, it's a, an incredible resource. I'm, I'm very proud of that. Uh, okay, so the, we have a reading room. The reading room is collection of local histories. Um, there's also a number of authors locally, uh, people who have, have written about the local history. Um, there are also people who have written biographies about these people. So that's all in the reading room along with a lot of other things like archaeological reports and all the engineering reports and things like that. And that's always something I'm working to build, also church and school histories. And some of the other collections, archaeological uh, histories, because this area was occupied uh, prehistorically by the St. Lawrence Iroquois. We have a number of, because uh, I actually studied this in university back in the Dark Ages, uh, I've collected all these, these reports. So we have those. Um, I've also got uh, Dr. Uh, Malin Locke is a familiar name around here. Um, I have collections of, of his shoes. Um, not his personal shoes, the shoes that he designed. Um, there's a lot of books about him. There's a lot of uh, photos, a lot, a lot of memorabilia as well. And then within the last few months, somebody came to my door with the full run of the Williamsburg Time, which was written during the time when Dr. Locke was at his peak in his 1930s. The entire collection. Uh, National Archives doesn't even have that. So that's, that was a huge discovery, and we have the whole entire thing now. So everything is, is building that way. Um, Dr. Marion Hilliard, Marion Hilliard, some people have heard me uh, talk about her. I try to have her nominated to the Canadian Medical Hall of Fame. Um, she's from Morrisburg. She was one of those people who developed the PAP test, which any female has awareness of. And yet nobody knows about her around here. So that was part of my campaign, was to try to get her acknowledged in history. She wrote about 34 articles in Chatelaine Magazine and a bunch of books um, in the 1950s about women's history, talking about things that people didn't talk about, like menopause. God forbid you mention that word in the 1950s. So uh, she was well known then, but she's not so well known now. Anyway, we have a lot of other collections. Uh, most recently, because Beavers has closed, Sibiron, um, I have now acquired their archives, and I'm working on getting that organized. So there's, there's, it's always a work in progress. And uh, I also have a collection of videotapes that have been donated to me. Uh, some of them are local fairs, so they're like home videos, but of local uh, events. And then some of them were produced by um, different organizations like uh, the Canadian Film Board about the likes of Ken Carter, a number of Ken Carter. He was the guy who um, tried to rocket a car across the St. Lawrence. Uh, didn't happen that way, but uh, my great hope is somehow to figure out how we can digitize these things because any type of videotape, VHS, is a magnetic media and they just deteriorate. So that's one of my goals in the future is to get that. 
Uh, microfilm collection, quite a, quite a collection that we got donated from Upper Canada Village because they had grant money to digitize everything and they also donated the microfilm reader. A lot of local history, uh, you know, going back to court, court records and uh, parliamentary records and things like that. So that was quite the valuable collection and very appreciative to them. Uh, most recently, I had two individuals, one from Seattle, Washington, who came to visit, and a couple from Niagara on the Lake donated hundreds of photographs of Iroquois and Morrisburg in the area dating back to the 1890s. I mean, these are quite an invaluable collection. And they also had a number of letters from the 1860s, all originals, and more significantly, they donated a whole lot of archival supplies, so we were quite appreciative of that. Um, picture of one of the houses being moved. Uh, St. Lawrence Seaway, as I mentioned, there's a lot of uh, materials coming in about that, and I'm working to, to build up as much of a collection as I can. Moving forward, the picture. These are uh, items that were found in the attic of the old building, the municipal building in Williamsburg. There were dating from the 1850s to 1940, um, things like birth, death, marriage records, um, assessment records, things along that line, and that's some of the ones that that brought. But uh, basically moving forward, uh, the hope is to continue on the path, try to find a way to digitize some of these um, videos, trying to help people to do their research however I can. So I guess that's basically, that, that was it. Awesome. Thank you. Questions, questions comments from Councilor Councilor Smith. I've lived in this area all my life, and I don't think I've ever heard of Dr. Hilliard before. I, well, I, I I'll make sure that you do. <laughs> <laughs> um, Her I, father was also, he was a local lawyer, but he was also a member of the provincial legislature. Oh, really? Okay. So, but that was in the 19, well, he died in the 1950s. So okay. after that, the people kind of lost lost memory of them because they weren't around anymore. Okay. But she was huge in Canadian history. And the other claim to fame is in the $10 bill where they were looking for an image of a woman to put on, she was actually on the short list, Dr. Marilyn Hilliard. It was uh, Viola Desmond who, who won the honor. But So everybody else seems to know about her but Morrisburg. <laughs> well, yeah, so, yeah, everybody, that's newspaper pages would you want to digitize if you had the funding? Um, that I actually hadn't calculated. We have, well, there's a list that I have that was part of the package which, which had the newspapers that have been digitized and there's also ones that haven't yet been done. Um, so we're looking at, um, I have done none of the Dundas Farmer, which is basically 10 years of papers. The Morrisburg Leader, they had kept back uh, everyone that ended in the year one and in the year two for, their, for the archives section, um, and none of those have been done. And then the Williamsburg Times, basically 1932 to 1938, those are the only ones that hadn't been completed yet. Um, as far as how many pages, probably a thousand. Okay. I'm thinking, but I could be, it could be off. It's, it's these papers were never consistently the same number of pages. Yeah, yeah. But like I said, always looking for whatever grants might be out there. Well, I, I know for for myself, and I've uh, talked with uh, Mayor Fraser from North Dundas. You know, the, our archives, our shared archives, is a very important piece of our, our history that we want to preserve and will continue to support. And I'm on the uh, community uh, council, so yep. I'll be joining in the next meeting and, and getting more information and, and finding ways to, to uh, continue to move on and find funding and, and to participate. And we do participate with our MP, Eric Duncan, is on our, our committee as well. So we'll continue with, with all that. So I certainly appreciate your time and the volunteers' time that, that, that uh, are put in. And glad to hear that there's use of it and people are coming and there's lots of information. And it's uh, also a, can be a history lesson for us. So thank you very yep. much. Mm -hmm. Thank you.
Okay, as we uh, switch over, our third delegation for tonight uh, from the Ontario Artisan Wines, uh, Craig McMillan, and he's joining us online. Good evening, uh, Mr. Mayor and Council. I've just shared my screen. I don't know if it's come up at your end for the presentation. Yes, it has. Okay, perfect. So I'll get uh, started. So thank you for having uh, us this evening or permitting us to speak. Uh, I'm on here on behalf of Ontario Artisan Wineries. I'm the interim chair. I have a winery in North Glengarry and Noreen and Mark uh, from Stonecrop Acres are in your area and they weren't able to come with me tonight or appear tonight so I'll just be speaking on my own. So we're here seeking your support to eliminate the LCBO markup and wine levy imposed on the direct delivery of 100% Ontario non-VQA wine to a licensee. So in simple terms, we have uh, wineries in Eastern Ontario that are not enough VQA. They want to sell to a restaurant. They pay an exorbitant uh, fee, which actually present, prevents them from selling at all. And I'll explain that in a little bit more detail. So who's Ontario Artisan Wineries? And we were incorporated uh, in the last spring, 2022. It was really coming out of the frustration and experience we had in trying to get some attention to some issues that are impacting uh, small artisan wineries in Ontario. So we have members in Eastern Ontario mostly, but also Prince Edward County and Erie North Shore. We are members who only produce local wines and they're less than 2000 cases, which is very small in the big wine uh, industry of Ontario, which the EQA would consider a small winery to be 20,000 cases. Uh, we're separate from the Eastern Ontario wine producers. I'm not sure if you've heard of them or not. Smokey LeBlanc is the president of that uh, group, and they're more of an umbrella organization that represent meateries, cideries, fruit wineries, and grape wineries. We're solely dedicated to Ontario artisan wineries, and we're more provincial in scope rather than, than regional. So what's the impact of the LCBO markup and wine levy 100% Ontario non-VQA wines? Um, it has actually effectively barred us from selling to local restaurants. So if Stonecrop Acres want to sell to a restaurant, um, they might do a little bit just to uh, have a bit of a lost leader, but there's no ability to sell any quantity because of the uh, prices that uh, are the charges that are imposed as I'll go into. Um, this is limiting development of local agritourism and rural diversification in our view. It's certainly punishing growers of 100% Ontario grapes and that's adversely impacting our sustainability and also the development of rural economies and in our view it's inconsistent with Ontario being open for business and supporting local. Eastern Ontario has the potential to become an important wine region in not only Ontario and Canada but uh, this is an obstacle that we're going to talk about that needs to be overcome among some others but this is one of the most important ones that's going to prohibit that from uh, prohibit it's going to restrict that from happening. Just a short list of some of the OAW wineries that are impacted. Um, I'm not going to go through that list, but you can see there's quite a few in Stormont, Dundas, Langary, and Prescott Russell, as well as uh, Leeds, uh, Grenville. We estimate there's probably 30 to 40 non-DQA wineries in the province that are impacted by this. I won't go over the uh, graphic in too much detail because the next slide is going to show those numbers in, in more specific format, but it just gives you a bit of a visual of the disparity between what the revenue take home of a VQA winery versus a non-VQA winery is when you're delivering wine direct to a local restaurant. So in terms of the numbers, I've used an example here of a $20 bottle of wine. Um, in your materials, you'll have what's called an LCBO calculator. So this isn't Macmillan making up numbers or the OAW. Who I punch these numbers, uh, the $20 value into the LCBO calculator and it punches out or uh, pushes out these uh, numbers and percentages and that's where that's come from. So that $20 bottle of wine through the jigs and reels, as they say, becomes $18.02 uh, as a selling price and the wine, so these percentages and numbers are off that $18.02. The winery revenue for a VQA winery on that $20 bottle is 80%, which is 14 and change. The non-VQA winery is 52% and is receiving $9.45. The real uh, major feature is the provincial revenue, which is 14% for the VQA winery, which is $2, $2.5. Uh, the non-VQA winery, though, is paying 42%, which is $7.58. The federal and container deposit are the same for both uh, wineries, regardless of VQA or non-VQA. 
Um, so the red numbers are the important ones. The total charges for the BQA winery are 19, it's 19.7 percent, which is three dollars and fifty-five cents. But we're paying 47.5 uh, percent, which is eight dollars and fifty-seven cents. That primarily is coming. You'll see at the bottom of that slide, the second line up. The difference is the Elsevier markup of six dollars and the wine levy of a dollar twenty-one. Um, just for information more than anything, the excise tax has been reimposed on wine. I won't go into the reasons for that, but it's essentially to settle a trade uh, dispute that uh, we were having with Australia, that Canada was having. So when you add that excise tax in, we're actually over 50%, almost 51% uh, taxes or charges that we're paying. So it's, it's pretty significant and it's, it's a barrier for us. Just to extrapolate that a little bit further into a case of wine, so you've got 12 uh, bottles that are valued at $20 each. The VQA winery is going to have $173 in revenue. That non-VQA winery is going to have $113, which is $60 less. If you push that to 1,000 cases or 12,000 bottles, the VQA winery is going to make uh, $60,000 more than the non-VQA winery. And to give it even a little bit more scale and effect on 2,000 cases, I'm sorry, on 2,000 cases, it's a $120,000 difference. So we're paying $120,000 more in LCBO charges than the VQA winery is for the same from a bottle of wine that's made with 100% Ontario grapes. And the way I kind of explain it is this way. You've got a VQA winery and a non-VQA winery. They both produce a bottle of wine from 100% Ontario grapes. They sell that bottle of wine at their store on the farm and they pay the same LCBO charges and taxes. The second that that non-BQA winery pulls the cork on that bottle and pours it into a glass at their winery, they're getting 27% plus increase in charges. Or the second they take it to a local restaurant and sell it, they're paying 27 plus percent uh, in additional charges. So we don't see the sense of that, uh, especially when it's not treated differently when it's in the store being sold as a bottle. So where is the authority for the LCBO to impose these, uh, the markup and wine levy? To be frank about it, I started looking at this with more attention. We got into the industry in 2016 is when we did our first vintage. We were licensed by 2019 and opened. And uh, while I was generally aware there was a lot of restrictions and other things around, I didn't really appreciate the significance of this LCBO markup and wine levy. And as our winery started to grow, we see that the revenue channel of local, uh, which is part of our agritourism model, selling local is, uh, is important to sustain us. And um, so I started asking some questions. It took me about a year in discussions uh, with the Ministry of Finance Alcohol Policy Branch and they advised that it was section four subsection one of the liquor control board of ontario act which gives the lcbo natural rights of a person essentially so although they're a, a monopoly on the uh, alcohol uh, businesses in ontario they as a business can impose a markup and levy just like any other business does on a product that it's selling they have that discretion to do that why is this really important for several years we were told repeatedly by industry organizations that it would, would take legislative change to have that markup and wine levy removed. Once I found this was a natural rights issue, it became a policy decision. So it's discretionary by LCBO. The Ministry of Finance is the one that would be giving direction to LCBO. Now I'm a realist, policy decisions can be just as hard to uh, change course on as legislation, but we're at least now not talking about legislative uh, change or amendment. The irony is in the last point there that if the LCBO market of wine levy were removed, it actually would increase provincial revenue because we would start selling to local producers, I'm sorry, to local restaurants. Now, I'm not talking hundreds of millions of dollars here, but it would be an increase in, in the money that uh, would come into the provincial coffers. So I'm gonna ask a question you're probably thinking about, well, why don't you just join the EQA? Um, this is a 15 minute discussion in itself, but don't worry, I'm gonna try and do it in a couple minutes here without being uh, too complicated about it. So most of the wineries in Eastern Ontario, just by nature of the climate, are forced to grow cold climate grapes, they're called. These have been around for quite a few years, but they really have started to take off in the last uh, 10 or 15 years. University of Minnesota and uh, Cornell are leaders in the field, but there's private grape breeders 
And what they've done is they've taken Vitis vinifera, which is the warm climate grape, which is predominantly grown by BQA wineries in Niagara and Prince Edward County. They've cross-pollinated them with North American grape varieties that are cold hardy. And one of those is Vitis vinifera. Good disease resistance, good cold hardiness, but not the greatest grape to make wine with. So they cross-pollinate these plants, they start having a genealogy or a family history just like humans do. And in simple terms, BQA has a rule that says you must have 0% Labrusca parentage in a grape variety if you want to have it approved by us. And that effectively prevents us from getting our grapes approved because every variety I have, and most that I'm aware of, of cold climate grapes have a percentage of Labrusca. It may not be a lot, it may be four to eight percent, but it's it's in there. So they follow their own rules. We can't become BQA. I say that because they have approved the grape recently and it had 4.6% Labrusca in it. So I'm asking questions. Well, how did you approve it if your rule is zero? Um, even if it were, they were approved, though, these cold climate grapes, we don't get full recognition. So we'd be asked to pay full freight to be a BQA member, all the costs and fees that come with that, but because there is this predominant view that the only good winemaking it comes from Vitis vinifera, they would only allow us to use BQA Ontario and we wouldn't be allowed to have an Appalachian uh, attribution, which is particularly important. So you're second class citizen as far as they're concerned. The other important element is that any benefit that we would get by reducing the LCBO charges um, by becoming BQA would be nullified by the cost of joining BQA and just simple courier fees would add up to thousands of dollars because they have requirements to send in documents and uh, wine and testing. Another simple example is their testing for a wine is $350. I pay $80 for a private lab to test. So um, if you're selling more than 2,000 cases, the more cases you sell, the less the BQA fees and charges become an issue. But this is where people are missing the boat. We're only 2,000 cases. We're not going to sell 2,000 cases to a licensee because we need to have some in our store and we need them for farmer's market. So that cost is pretty significant and it really offsets any advantage that we would have by joining BQA. So that's the practical financial reason. Um, the other reason is philosophically, none of us are interested in exporting. We're too small to an export market and we really can't go into the LCBO stores because we don't have the volume that they usually uh, require. We're local agritourism um, producers. We'd like to partner with local uh, producers, and that's our model. It's not trying to be taking over the world of the wine industry. LCBO volume is an issue, as I've already mentioned. We just simply couldn't meet that demand. And they have other demands, which I'm not being critical of. I understand why they need to have standardization, but their manual on packaging is 62 pages long. It's got graphs, charts, and tables saying, your paper or your cardboard can be only so shiny. It has to have font of this size. It has to reflect this kind of light. The boxes have to be this size. So again, I understand why LCBO has that, but it's not something that a small 2,000 case winery is going to be able to meet without uh, it becoming way too expensive. And lastly, climate change, sustainable growing practices and consumer expectations are in our view really redefining how this the BQA or the European Appalachian model um, would exist because even France is starting to look at disease resistant and hybrid grapes. So the world is a changing and uh, we think we're consistent with climate by growing the proper grapes that are suitable here without having to take extreme measures to protect them. So I could grow warm climate grapes on my farm. Every winter I'd have to lay them down and cover them with geotextile or straw or dirt and even then I would have the possibility of damage and Nova Scotia just lost 95% of its warm climate crop. Um, they know that by mid-February. They had the two warmest climates, or sorry, two warmest months uh, on record, December and January in Nova Scotia. And then they get a 20 degree temperature drop. Their wines were not ready for that. And because they're warm climate or bit of Fera, they have only 5% bud survival rate that's projected. So <clears throat> changing the LCBO policy decision, we've decided to adopt a tiered approach. We've been speaking with townships that have impacted wineries, such as yours, uh, in their jurisdiction. We then have gone to the United Counties as well and uh, engaged with MPP. So I'm just going to briefly show you that, you know, we've been putting some legwork in uh, on this. 
So starting with the Great Brewers of Ontario, this was an important uh, development for us last fall. They uh, agreed, the board adopted a resolution that all 100% Ontario grapes should be treated the same, whether BQA or non-BQA, when delivering directly to a licensee. Glengarry Federation of Agriculture has been very supportive and um, I was able to be a delegate at the OFA AGM last fall and they passed the resolution there resoundingly at 96 plus percent, which was ultimately supported by the board uh, in January. And you'll see there that in February, the board of OFA wrote a letter to the Minister of Finance requesting elimination of the markup and wine levy. We're engaged with Prescott Russell Chamber of Commerce and uh, they uh, signaled they will be writing a letter to the Minister of Finance. Restaurants Canada has also indicated a letter to the Minister of Finance will be forthcoming. Um, North Hungary has been particularly supportive because that's where I'm located, that's where we started. Um, they requested a delegation at Roma last, uh, this spring, or I'm sorry, in January. Um, Stephen Sarazan, or Stefan Sarazan, the MPP for Prescott, Russell North Hungary was with us. We did a presentation to the parliamentary assistant to the Ministry of Finance. He's since confirmed that he has briefed the Minister of Finance on these issues. And um, we've had Stephen Learty signal that he will speak with the Minister of Finance. Uh, Steve Clark has written a letter, the MPP for Leeds Grenville, um, and supports a policy change on examination of the policy. MPP Goldie uh, Gamare has indicated she'll be sending a letter and will be speaking to the Minister of Finance, as is Stefan Sarazan, as I've mentioned. Todd Smith has also said that he is supportive and will be speaking to the Minister of Finance. Um, and so to sort of start to close this off, Nolan Quinn, um, as you are aware, likely has sent a letter to the Minister of Finance and supported us. Township of Champlain as well has passed a resolution as has SDG and South Hungary has also adopted a, a resolution supporting uh, the elimination of the LCB markup on wine levy. And finally, the United Counties of Leeds and Grenville have signed, have supported a resolution. Edwardsburg, Cardinal, the township is also, as has the United Counties of Prescott, Russell. And last Wednesday, the city of Ottawa passed a resolution or a motion by Catherine Kitts, who has a winery in her ward in Navin. And this was supported by the Agriculture and World Affairs Committee unanimously that the mayor write to the Minister of Finance and report back on the elimination of the LCB charges. So that brings us to basically the final slide. So those letters will be in the materials that you have um, and some of the resolutions as well. And we're asking that uh, council uh, consider adopting a, a proposed resolution we've provided to support the elimination of the LCB markup and wine levy and circulate it to the Minister of Finance and other relevant uh, ministers. So we, you know, that's what we provided for your consideration. Um, that brings me to my um, end of my piece, so I'm available for any questions you may have, Mr. Mayor, or your councillors. Well, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Craig. Thanks, uh, Mr. McMillan. Uh, second time through, as I heard it at the uh, SDNG County meeting as well. Uh, certainly well presented, and uh, I'll open it up to the, to the floor if we have any questions or comments from uh, council. I think it's, uh, yeah, Councillor Smith. Uh, yeah, I, I don't have any uh, questions, but I just wanted to make a few comments. Um, I just want to say that I do think that, um, in my mind, a vineyard is a farm. It doesn't matter if your vineyard's only maybe a half acre in size or if your farm is a thousand acres growing corn and soybeans, it's a farm is a farm. And so I'm 100% behind anything that is involving in, uh, involves farming as well. Um, a vineyard, especially ones that we have in Eastern Ontario, basically fall under the agritourism category and I'm 100% behind anything in that category as well. So you have my support. Thank you. Hello, Deputy Mayor, you're online. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, and, and again, yeah, this was the second presentation from Craig that I heard. Um, always learn a little bit more every time you hear about this. But, uh, you know, certainly this is, is you know, in our opinion, is an unfair disadvantage uh, for small rural businesses to strive to be sustainable. I mean, it goes against what ag tourism is supposed to be about. And, you know, I, I Craig, I mean, I had this discussion with Mark and, and Maureen a couple weeks ago. I mean, to me, if, if how do we grow businesses if there's barriers? You know, if, if you want to grow your business or Stonecrop want to grow their business, and let's say you do want to get to 2,000 or beyond cases of wine that you're selling, 
I mean, there should be any barriers for small businesses to again grow and thrive and be sustainable. So, you know, I certainly support, I think South Dundas needs to, needs to uh, provide a, re a resolution as well, resolution of support for this. Um, and, and, and I think, uh, I think everybody else is on board around us, including, uh, uh, Nolan Quinn and, and, and others and other municipalities. So yeah, I'm in support of adopting, uh, adopting a resolution of support. Thank you. Any further comments? So I think, uh, we're in support of the resolution and, uh, we'll direct staff to do so. Okay. Thank you very much. And, um, we look forward to hopefully pushing that rock up a hill. Absolutely. Thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it. Okay. We're going to move to action request, uh, 7A tender results for TS 2305, a plow truck joining us is uh, director of transportation, Mr. Hyman. Welcome. Thank you, Mayor and Council. So in front of you is a, the results of the tender which closed uh, last week, or sorry, this Monday, uh, I believe. No, last Monday. So um, during the 2023 budget deliberations, Council and staff discussed the recommendations of replacing Unit 57, which is currently our spare truck uh, due to the double frame being uh, in excess of the allowable tolerances under MTO standards and will no longer pass its annual safety inspection. Unit 62, the oldest frontline plow truck, would become our spare, and this new plow truck would then become one of our nine frontline plow um, vehicles. So we received one bid from Premier Truck Group out of Belleville um, for the supply of a snow plow with the uh, proper harness um, for the uh, municipality. There was uh, a tender uh, regularity under the mathematics uh, side of, port of, of the uh, um, tender. So under section C, uh, irregularity number 10, under mathematical errors, it was a minor irregularity. And you'll notice as one of your attachments, uh, it was had to do with costing. They, uh, they gave us the unit price plus HST and then in turn charged just HST again uh, under the mathematical side of things. So they did clarify it. Uh, so the pricing that you, do, that you receive for 375,985 is the true cost uh, plus HST. Um, I can answer any questions which you may have at this time. Questions, comments, Councillor Vino. Yeah, so uh, so obviously it's more money than we thought, but I've 100% expected that. And uh, frankly, from my professional experience, I'm surprised we got any tenders at all, and especially with a delivery date in January. Um, we're ordering trucks a year out right now, and uh, so going to tender for a plow truck for this winter, I was actually kind of surprised that we got anything. So. Uh, uh, my opinion is uh, we should take what we can get in this case because uh, I can tell you that the pricing only goes up. So that's, uh, that's where I stand on that one. Good. Any other questions, comments? So we have been deliberating fleet budgets over our, since our first day involved. So I have a motion uh, that the Council of Municipalities South Dundas accept report TS 2023-02 to award the tender for the purchase of a 6x4 SBA diesel cab and chassis with Proline 2 box, plow and wing to Premier Truck Group in the amount of $375,985 plus HST. Motioner for Councillor Ward. Seconder, Councillor Vino. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank you, Director Hyman. Moving to action 7B, charity tax rebate 2022. Acting treasurer in his last few days with us, Mr. McDonald. Yeah, they're the last few. They're not my most healthy few I've had, but uh, <laughs> the charity tax rebate is something that the counties, they have a bylaw that allows us to, uh, to allow certain organiza organizations uh, to uh, write off some of their taxes. Uh, this particular one is CMHA Champlain East. It's for $350. Uh, they applied last year, they'll apply next year. Um, and it's, it's within the budget of $60,000. Uh, 
uh, for all write-offs for the municipality. So um, I don't want to read the whole report, but if you have any questions, I'm glad to answer. Any questions on the tax write-off for $348? All right, can I have a motion that the Council of Municipal South Dundas accept report FS 2023-01 and approve write-off of the municipal portion of the charity tax rebate for CMH Champlain East in the amount of $348.73 pursuant to the United County's bylaw number 4734. Motioner, Councillor Ward. Seconder, Councillor Smith, all in favor? Carried. Thank you, uh, Treasurer McDonald. Okay, moving along to uh, bylaws. So under 8A, uh, a, a bylaw, uh, an emotion that uh, we have the opportunity as Deputy Mayor uh, St. Pierre and myself sit on the uh, County's um, council that we can name a backup in our absence. So I have a recommendation as per uh, the bylaw that we uh, appoint Cole Vino as alternate to the United Counties. Cole, would you accept that position? Yep. I you do? <laughs> yeah, yep. Thank you. For, as the uh, top vote getter, it is your, as has the first choice. So I do have a motion the bylaw 2023 12 being bylaw to appoint Cole Vino as an alternate member of the United County Stormont Dundas and Glengarry. Be read first, second, and third time, Pass, signed, and sealed. Motioner, Councillor Ward, seconder, Councillor, Deputy Mayor St. Pierre, all in favor? Abstained, carried. Thank you, uh, Councillor Vino. First meeting is next Monday. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, 8B, budget. So, I know Sean Mason, uh, Deputy Treasurer Sean Mason is online. If you, and uh, we have Treasurer McDonald here as well. Uh, Deputy Treasurer Mason, did you want to comment first? Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Uh, we last discussed the budget on February 23rd, and as a result of those discussions, the 2023 net tax levy has been reduced a further 36400 to the current to the current amount shown of 8.19 million, or a 5.5% increase over the 2022 net tax levy. Uh, everything else is reflected in the report, and if you have any questions, I will uh, have to make to answer. Questions or comments for uh, Deputy Treasurer Mason or uh, Acting Treasurer McDonald? Seeing none, I have a motion that bylaw number 2023-13 being a bylaw to set the 2023 estimates of all sums required be read, passed, and open council, signed and sealed. Motion by Councillor Ward, seconded by Councillor Vino. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank you very much, treasurers. Moving on to 8C, Fees and Charges, and we have our Manager of Parks Rec Facilities, Mr. David Jansen, welcome. Good evening, Mayor and Council. So in front of you tonight is the uh, update for the 2023 fee bylaw. Uh, this is a report that Council will tend to see every year in their term as we update fees. Uh, most of the fees that we are updating this year are in the Parks Rec and Facilities world. Uh, so it's all broken down by section there. It's a long bylaw, but I broke it down in section within the report. Um, so the marina, a little bit of clarification and update as per to our rates within uh, what was approved within the budget. And then the hall rentals is the next section. Uh, we sort of combined all the hall rentals into a hall rather than breaking them down by hall. And then again, some minor additions and changes. Uh, the campground section, which again is just some minor housekeeping and then update as per the approved budget. Um, then is the arena, which I know during our orientation session was a, a big discussion. We've sort of fallen a little bit behind on how much we were subsidizing arena ice time rates. Uh, so there's a little bit of catch up in there as well as some clarification. And I know during the orientation, uh, many members of council wanted a bit more data. So I put the data within the report there. So hopefully everybody got a chance to look through some of that. And then the last section that we're doing, so just some minor updates to is the programming section. 
Um, staff mostly just did some minor housekeeping items here. Uh, I do think the section needs a little bit more revision, but I'm hoping that we can continue to collect data from our new online booking system and sort of once we have the data, similar to what we just did with the arena, is take the data that we have and come up with the right rate plan and a proper a schedule from there. So I'm happy to answer any questions that Council might have. Questions for Manager Jansen? Comments? Uh, Councillor Ward. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I guess my only question, I see you did do some consultation with um, the Speaker Skating Club and Minor Hockey, and they were amenable to these increases, or I did see what it would cost the players, but were they amenable? Did they have any feedback? They were amenable. I mean, uh, both groups sort of knew that it was coming because it had they knew that our rates were falling a little bit behind their neighbors around them. I, I wouldn't say either of them are excited to see their rates go up, but mm -hmm. they were amenable to them. And I know most were sort of in, knew that it was going to fall into the range that it did end up falling within. Okay. Thank you. Deputy Mayor St. Pierre. Yeah, just a comment on uh, Schedule C, the water and wastewater um, definitions, not really in the definitions, but the conditions and whatnot. I just kind of quickly read through that. And the question I have is, is, is your materials that you kind of talk about in that Schedule C consistent with South Dundas's uh, municipal standards for engineering design? What page is that on, Councillor, or sorry, Deputy Mayor? Uh, it would have been, I don't have the page in front of me. It's just a general question. I, I just know um history on the dutch metals uh, that there's quite a design uh standard uh binder that's been created mm -hmm. and i think on the laterals the service laterals uh you mentioned that it's just copper mm -hmm. but i believe the standards uh allow for uh plastic and or copper no we'll, so we'll certainly look at this in, in regards to the engineering designs and make sure yeah. it mirrors mirrors both for sure yeah, yeah, for yeah. sure. That was just my general comment. Yep. Maybe just uh, take another look at that to make sure you're consistent with the design standards. Yep. Nope, absolutely. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Comments or questions? Nope. Councillor uh, Smith? Um, the only question I had was about the the advertising in the arena. We, we briefly touched on this before um, the when it came to Zamboni advertising that we were possibly be going to be I know that there was a bit of an increase put in here but we were talking about maybe doing quite a bit more increase and I just wondered is, is when we is that something that we were we'd be looking at now or is this going to be maybe next year or when are we or is this going to happen at all or what do we think yeah, so to add on to your question, so in our training session when we did the review, um, the, the, when we got to this line item, we, is, we had talked about potentially, you know, make, put it out to bid or tender because we thought it might be okay. one of a bigger of, uh, item um, uh, to bring back to council. So go ahead, uh, Director. Yeah, so through you, Mayor, very similar comments to you. Um, I'll bring an action report at the time or I'll include it within the action report for procurement of the new Zamboni that was included in the budget. Okay. I think when we get a new Zamboni or ice resurfacer of whatever model it might be, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I think that might open the door that maybe we remove the current Zamboni advertising and it's the time to make change is when we get the new unit. Okay. And I'm considering going out to tender to purchase a five-year term of a wrap on the Zamboni or something like that. It's residents of South Dundas might remember the Wonder Bread Zamboni for a while here in South Dundas. So. Yeah. Deputy Mayor St. Pierre. Uh, thank you, and through you, Mayor Broad, just to add on to that advertising, uh, what I noticed in Chesterville, too, is they had full-door advertisements on their change rooms. Uh, I think I think we need to start really taking advantage and, get, and getting that uh, and, and off offering that up as well. I think that's a good source of revenue for us. Yeah, final comments for uh, for myself. So uh, certainly sitting on the executive of minor hockey for 12 years, we have discussed every year uh, in anticipation of, of a fee increase. So this is not a surprise. Obviously, it hits the bottom line to registrants. So I'm sure minor hockey will A, look at the exact amount of hours they rent according to their budget based on the costs and uh, pass that on. And I do know 
for ourselves. We minor hockey has never participated in the grant uh, situation because we felt we were getting good value, but we may see minor hockey make up. We're asking to support some, you know, maybe uh, less privileged children in, in their registration fees, but that would be for them to, to look at. We can certainly look at that. And then lastly, uh, I would like us to take a look at, and we can have further discussions um, with the uh, baseball field rentals on the uh, competitive side. I think we have an opportunity to charge uh, at that, um, but we can look at that for the 2024 seasons. I know uh, being uh, somewhat involved with that as well, I said we were definitely uh, could and should be paying um, a fees for uh, competitive baseball in the use of the fields for sure. So I think that's another opportunity. Any other comments, questions? So we have a uh, motion that bylaw number 2023-14 being a bylaw to rescind bylaw 2022-70 to establish fees and charges collected at various municipal departments to be read and passed in open council, signed and sealed. Moved by Councillor Ward, seconded by Councillor Vino. All in favor? Carried. Thank you very much, Manager Jansen. Last item under bylaws 8D, adult, or sorry, Alt Monroe Drain Maintenance Billing. And we have uh, Acting Treasurer McDonald with us. Uh, thank you and through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I can get into what municipal drains are, but I'm, I'm fairly certain most of you know they're the di pretty much ditches that run through cornfields or our fields and they collect water and bring it to an outlet. So this is Altman Road. It was done in 2020. Um, the amount there was 3,878. Uh, the work gets done by the drainage superintendent. Uh, and then we have to allocate those costs to the, um, the people that are within an engineer's report. This is that allocation. Um, it is updated uh, as we can because lot fabric does change. I believe now when severances are done, the, uh, the person who's severing the lot uh, pays for an engineer to update the drain to uh, account for that. As you see here, uh, we received $937.23 from Omafra, a one-third farm grant, uh, leaving 2,784 left. Everything under $9.99 is absorbed by the township. Often that's multiple properties because it just makes sense. <laughs> uh, the administration effort is often um, greater than that, that amount. So if there's any questions, I'm glad to answer them. Questions or comments on the Alt Monroe Drain billing? Seeing none, I have a motion on the bylaw 2023-15 being a bylaw to assess the maintenance costs of the Alt Monroe Municipal Drain be read and passed in open council, signed and sealed. Motion by Councillor Smith, seconded by Councillor Vino. All in favor? Carried. Thank you very much. Cons consent agenda under nine. We have lots that are in your package. I think we have up 14. Be yes. So, oh, uh, yes. clerk. Thank you, Mayor Broad. <laughs> um, we just notice that the first item on the consent agenda uh, is actually meant to be for the next council meeting so you'll you'll notice there's no attachment to it that would be uh, report uh, a regional waste management working group so if I could just suggest making a small amendment to the resolution um, uh, when accepting the consent agenda um, to just include as amended and I'll be able to delete that uh, remove that first report that snuck on there somehow. Thank you, Clerk LeBrun. Thank you. Under consent agenda, so 9B, Planning Building Enforcement, the February statistics, Council Renumeration, CARA, the Building Planning and Enforcement, February statistics, the letter from the Town of Coburg on the homeless and unsheltered, a letter about the 401 Altsville Creek culvert replacement, a letter uh, about the ice machine, the Morrisburg Fire Association is receiving. A memo with Two Creeks Forest Conservation Maintenance. Uh, a memo on the upcoming um, conservation uh, workshop and meetings. Resolution for the Niagara Region Declaration of Emergency for the Homeless. A resolution from the Township of Don and Fromia, the school board expenses, election expenses. Resolution of all municipalities, school board Election expenses, resolution of the City of Montreal high-speed train, Quebec to Toronto, 
resolution from the English School Board to extend the moratorium. Resolution of Adam Kent, reducing municipal insurance costs. And a letter from the Municipal Class Environment Assessment. Any comments on any on those consent agenda items? So I have a motion that all the items under consent section of the agenda be adopted except 9A as amended. Moved by Councillor Smith, seconded by Councillor Vino, sorry, Councillor Ward. All in favor? Carried. Okay, under 10, boards, committees, discussion items. So the request for grants and donations. Whoops. Well, I'll leave that till after. As I move to my budget binder. <laughs> so we do have uh, actually Treasurer McDonald's with us to help us through discussion on our request for grants and donations. So I'm just going to forward just so I'm on the same slide as. Everybody else here, sorry. So, uh, so in our budget, we approved 107,500 for grants and donations. Um, and we have requests in excess of 120,000. So taking a look at uh, the spreadsheets, we need to determine A, how we plan to, uh, or which ones we plan to fund or not fund, or percentages thereof, it's up to us to decide. Uh, Treasurer McDonald, would you like to add on to my statement? Yes, and through you, Mr. Mayor, I'd be remiss. There were a few questions, just in case you had any, um, like, why the numbers were a little different there. Is there typically $3,500 that is, is not requested for that we give? So that's why you may have seen two, two different amounts, uh, one totaling 9800 Those are the active requests that were requested. Uh, but if you add in the 3500 for uh, two of the community groups that typically get it but did, don't typically ask, it's 13300 So you're right with your numbers. I just wanted to make sure that was clarified. And um, for the 50-50 grants, um, the, the levy for the Iroquois Plaza is included in the levy, sorry. So the amount for the Iroquois Plaza is in the levy. And, and the other two we did not proceed with based on uh, one a contract and uh, the other um, uh, just that wasn't pulled. So if I bring you then to page 172, there, there's a short summary there because uh, there, there's a lot of information here and you've seen it. Oh, sorry, is that sorry? I just switched to one, page two, sorry. So page 172, you see it's, it's a little bit shorter and condensed and, and it, you've gone through this probably through your budget binder and you, you might have your thoughts. Um, a few ways you can approach this is to, to look at everybody and say, uh, a little bit of off all of them, all off of one, or those conversations, I, I'll, I'll leave that to, to, to you and your council to decide how you wish to do that. Uh, ultimately, at the end of the day, you're looking for $13,300 to come off that. Excellent, thank you, uh, Treasurer McDonald. Yeah, certainly, I'd like to begin with a couple that, uh, you know, I threw out there that we could, could discuss. Uh, and just see what our feelings are and uh, obviously open discussion. So all input uh, at all times is, is gonna be warranted. So the one that uh, I kind of did draw my attention to is the one for the Mountain Township Agricultural Fair where they have not asked in the past and uh, fall outside of South Dundas. Granted, South Mountain uh, and the, the farmers their surrounding do touch into South Dundas, recognize that. Um, uh, so it's their first time coming with uh, a request, but also uh, we did approve at the counties, uh, we doubled uh, the contribution to local fairs. Um, so they would be qualified under, under, under that grant as well. Um, and I'm sure they apply to North Dundas. So that could be one that we could consider um, or discuss on, in, in my opinion. Any thoughts, thoughts or comments on my statements? Uh, Deputy Mayor? Uh, through uh, to you and through you, uh, Mayor Broad, I 100% I agree with that. That's one of the ones I had on my list. And and again, just as you said, it mainly because at the county count, county council level, we already approved an increase of donations to local fairs. And this, in my opinion, would fall under that category. Agree. Okay. Good. Okay. So that's five thousand. 
Uh, is there any other specific topics folks would like to take a look at? Councillor Ward? Yes. To, to administration. So the, um, the Iroquois Alliance Club, they have the, um, the gardens there. The, I, did we not give, have we given money in the past for that or was that, I apologize, I, I thought that they received money in the past, I just didn't. Yeah, I think the uh, director of uh, Parks and Rec can probably answer that. But I think, I believe we gave them a location and some topsoil, I believe. But uh, Mr. Jansen can probably provide some more. Yeah, so through you, Mayor, to Councillor Ward, in 2021, Council did approve the uh, uh, staff time and topsoil and the property between the apartments and the post office in Iroquois. However, uh, the group chose to go to a new location and then uh, the council decided not to support them in their new location. So they ended up getting nothing from the previous uh, requests. So it sort of, over, through time, it sort of changed and didn't come to fruition. Thank, thank you. I have, I, yep, Councillor Ward. So sorry, so yeah. just to go, I apologize uh, to, to the manager there. So they, they, we've already given them soil. Is the soil nothing. still, sorry? We gave nothing. Oh, we did, so no. sorry. Okay, never mind, thank you. That's all I needed. Yeah, one other, a couple other I see for discussion points on, uh, just looking at the overall, uh, overall picture. Uh, one is uh, beyond 21, so the, uh, I was reading through their request, uh, certainly a big increase from previous council's uh, donations and their, uh, their work that they do is throughout SDNG and we certainly have um, residents that, that um, use those uh, facility or, or facility registration for, uh, for club events and uh, activities, I guess, is the registration for activities would be the a more appropriate way to, to phrase it. I don't know if there was an opportunity there, if you know, if, if you had read through what the request was and any opportunity on that one, or if there's any new other information that we may have if we're directly involved with that one. I think, Mayor, to, to your point, if I may, through, yes. through you or to you, is, is, is that, do we know for sure, I did read that grant application, do we know that that's not being asked to all? Is that just us that they're asking? We don't know that right in, in the application. Yeah, so I, I mean, I, I read it. I've just read it again today in preparation for tonight. Yeah. I'm just trying to find the page. I said it earmarked it. Um, <laughs> it, it did say right that here. like it's a general request of all municipalities, uh, if I believe, um, let me just find the exact wording that they were. And one thing that kind of caught my eye too was that they, um, wanted it to uh, into their general fund. So offset true participant costs uh, to increase the number of ad adults we serve. Um, yeah, so it, uh, Seal Garrity. Yeah, uh, just for council information, usually uh, in the past, they have gone to county council looking for some funding. So I didn't know if they came to county council for 2023 or, or maybe not. Maybe they went to the lower tiers in, instead, but I think the general is that they go to every lower tier municipality and, and look for funding. On the one page, uh, Mayor, it does indicate that they they go to the city of Cornwall, yes. Township of South Glengarry, SDG, the counties, as, yeah. as the CAO indicated. So I guess. Rick, I'm just well, not certain from the application if they if they want twenty one thousand from all of us or <laughs> yeah it's yeah it's twelve they they have asked for twelve thousand yeah. beyond twenty one they're oh they're sorry 12, excuse 000. me yes yeah, the twelve thousand excuse yep. me yeah yep, for sure the twelve thousand It was, I think there's certainly opportunities for us if, you know, to, to meet our budget line, right? You know, we know costing, 
uh, things are costing us more and we, we put as much into this uh, budget line as we can. And I think we want to spend it all. We want to give it all away. But I think obviously we, we need to find some opportunities. And that could be one line that we reduce um, for sure. Um, I agree. I think just being it's uh, across more than just South Dundas, it's uh, not solely our responsibility to uh, fund. Sure. Any specific amount? We, uh, Deputy Mayor St. Pierre. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Uh, through you, Mayor Broad, I agree. We should reduce that amount. I would suggest um, a donation. I would increase the amount a little bit from last year. I do, reading read the application, I do think it's a worthwhile uh, program. So I would I would be comfortable of, of, of donating $5,000, which is a couple thousand dollars more, I believe, from last year. Um, so that would, that would reduce uh the number by another seven thousand yep that's kind of in the ballpark i was i was sitting in any comments uh, councillor smith uh the question that i had was so i we have the the 2022 number do, do we so we we have been donating to them for a, is there a history how, approximately how much would we have given them say for the last three or four years or do you or do you know uh through you there bro. I believe last year was probably the first year that we actually that was that was the first year that we yeah did. okay yeah. You, you know then this could be one too where we all really should uh, you know uh, have a delegation and have them come and, and talk more about what they do and how they're impacting our residents you know we certainly in, in a lot of these other line <laughs> items we are about mm -hmm. daily directly right uh, yeah. so we kind of know what's happening but this could be one uh, going into next year we, we want to continue you know, if they're looking for more funding and maybe we are responsible for more, you know, for some more granting, we should ask for a delegation and we can ask questions and, and get, mm -hmm. yeah, get more details on that. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Councillor Smith? Yeah, yeah. Uh, through you, Mayor Broad. I j um, just to, Deputy Mayor threw a number out there of 5,000. I just, in the back of my head, I was, honestly, I was just thinking 4,000 just because, like, with, the two numbers that we already are working on here, like that's almost going to put us right to where pretty, we need to, pretty right, close, right yeah. to where we need to be okay. almost. So that's I just had four thousand in my head as a number. Sure. So agreed. But let's come back. Yep. Okay. Uh, Deputy Mayor. Uh, through you, Mayor Brown. The other thing I just want to mention in my mind is I don't think we should get to the target. I think we should get to the target plus. I think it should be recognized that there are going to be groups later on and I, and I know we go through a budget there are going to be some groups that are going to come and request some funds at some point in time i'd like us to get down beyond the thirteen thousand. i think we should leave ourselves some some room about three to four thousand in our budget for items that just may come up during during the year or during our term first of the year um so that that's where i would go with that um just a couple other suggestions i would have is and I guess it's really a question maybe before before I say this. The Friends of the Bird Sanctuary, I mean, is that is the St. Lawrence Park Commission uh, fund the Bird Sanctuary? I was actually wondering that too the other day. I was down there. Or is I that all volunteer? Yeah, I think it's all volunteer run and, and the funding comes from the association itself, but I think it's a separate entity to the St. Lawrence Parks Commission. Okay. Yeah, and, and those trails you. fall in South Dundas and South yeah. Stormont. Yeah. They cross over, yeah. I know, on both properties. Yeah, yeah. so I, I agree, uh, Deputy uh, Mayor St. Pierre. Getting below the target is excellent. We leave ourselves some room for sure. Obviously, we definitely need to get to target. Uh, one of the new ones I'd like to have, or other ones that's new, I'd like to have discussion that's, that's a large one, is the mm -hmm. 21000 for J, uh, J, J.W. McIntosh for the transportation driver. Um, you know yeah. that's a that's a large amount and that's the first time through right and and reading uh, re reading their documents on that just cool. wonder if folks had thoughts on, on that particular item sorry. Vino. sorry I don't have it in front of me but I read through it before essentially they're requ requesting us to hire like pay for a full a full-time driver pay for a full-time driver yeah. yes yes so they've been um, in their uh, package request they they mentioned how they've been uh, doing this through volunteers uh, which is difficult uh, yeah. agreed um and this is a new uh, request uh where they're looking uh for twenty one thousand for uh, transportation for the year for throughout the year yes that's a significant 
request. Sorry, uh, CEO Garrity. Uh, just to give council some context, so uh, last year council did not give uh, them the, t the money, the funds for that. The year before during COVID, uh, they were given the $21,000. It's a kind of a, a one time to let them kind of get back on their feet, but that's kind of the, the rationale why, why the council last year did not give any of the funds is that it, it was more, uh, you know, supporting, they need to support that type of, of cost and it shouldn't come at the taxpayer's cost. So that was kind of the rationale for it, but certainly it's up to council where they want to proceed this year. You know, in their notes, they talk about they have 42 employees and over 80 volunteers. Uh, so I certainly understand during the COVID yep. times where that was yep. hard to get people, and that was uh, an option that, that council had, had done. Councillor Smith? Yeah, as a Mayor Brad, another question I had was, is where was the Williamsburg Cenotaph? So we, uh, I believe, we had discussed through the uh, assets uh, sale. We we're going to use okay. the, the reserve fund from when we sold the Williamsburg. That's where it's uh, okay. So that's why it's not. That's on why there. we don't see okay. it on here. Yes. Okay. But yeah, good, good question for okay. when yep. people have listened in in the past and, and knew that was uh, on there. Yep. But that's where we we're going to put that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Councilor Beadle? I think on the JW McIntosh one, it's. Uh, I, what they do is extremely important and everything is just, it's hard to justify to the South Dundas taxpayer that they're the ones paying for the, the driver, I think, is kind of where I sit on that one. It's, it's a, for me, it's a tough call because I really do appreciate that organization and, uh, and I think they need all the support they can get. It's just that's a large sum of money for the, for the South Dundas taxpayer. Deputy Mayor, St. Pierre. Uh, through you, Mayor Broad, I tend to agree uh, on the dollar amount that uh, Councillor Bean was saying. I think 21000 uh, a little bit high. Uh, so what I would suggest, and I, I believe it is, uh, my opinion, these are type of programs that we should be supporting, you know, for the seniors, for the youth, for the disability, for everything that, you know, we look at the county council, we went through, we went through the uh, uh, grant request there and, and you know, Ronald McDonald House. Items like that to me is what we should be supporting. Um, however, I think we, what we should do, again, same theme as the uh, Beyond 2021, I think we should support a dollar amount, but I also believe they should come in, do a delegation, let us, let it, or maybe we need to go visit them and let's let's better understand what the program is, what what actually they do, uh, what the money is for. But but certainly, I would support um, um, a ten thousand uh, dollar donation towards that program. Um, again, so if I'm just doing my quick math, if the five thousand for the Mountain Township uh, is reduced to zero, if we reduce the Beyond Twenty One, and I'll just say with the five thousand uh, theme, that's seven thousand. And then we reduce uh, the Macintosh uh, donation to from 21 to 10. That gets us to 23 thousand dollars. And and I know it's not a, it's this isn't an auction here of of yeah. of who wins and who loses or anything. Again, just in your two items, I think we should get a delegation and and uh, and really hear from them or again go go visit them and let's understand what the programs are. And again, for the uh, for the fair, I think that's supported at a county level. So to me, that that's that's where I was at with with the with the grants and uh, grants and donations. Yeah, when I looked at the overall picture, you know, ourselves, our supporting previous council had committed the fifty thousand, the Dundas Manor, and the three thousand a year for the hospice. So those were you know set. And we look at all of our community events that's happening in Matilda, in Iroquois, in Morrisburg. Folks are asking for two, three thousand dollars and I think we can meet all those needs, right? And they ask for in-kind and I think on a couple of these heavy hitters, let's, let's reduce them, let's support them, to your point, Deputy Mayor, and uh, let's get delegation and let's get more information because maybe we could be helping in other ways um, than, than just on this budget line item. Any, so, suggestion from Deputy Mayor St. Pierre, uh, is reduced by $11,100 on 
JW Macintosh line, reduced by 7,000 on Beyond 21, reduced by 5,000 on the uh, Mountain Township. A, or, or do we like that idea? And then B, is there any further discussion we'd like to have? Deputy, or sorry, uh, Councillor Ward. <laughs> There's an empty chair here. I know. There's <laughs> chair. I've moved over. Um, so uh, through you, Mayor, and to you, I think to the group that I think this is a, a responsible way to distribute the funds. I think uh, as a councillor, this, all these community events are extremely important to me. So it's really hard for me to sit here and say that one group deserves more than the other because I think I'd love to give them all exactly what they're asking for. But um, unfortunately, we just don't have the funds. So I think... Um, what W. Mayor is suggesting, as well as uh, Councillor Vino is suggesting, I, I would be amenable to that, and I think that it's a practical way to approach it, and I think going to visit these places to see what programs they have to offer, and then maybe next year uh, when they submit uh, their requests for donations, or maybe further on throughout the year if they need it, like the W. Mayor said, um, it gives us a better idea of what they need and why they need it. Okay, your medal. So I think the, we can set direction for staff on those three items. And uh, we can go from there. Any other questions or comments on the discussion item? Deputy Mayor? Uh, through you, Mayor Broad. So then the math should be if we were short 13.3, 13,300, we're reducing by 23. So it gives us $10,000 still in our budget to, uh, to, for other requests if they come in, or if we do delegate, have a delegation on a couple of these items, it still gives us some room to, uh, to, to be able to increase that donation by. Is that, is that fair to say? Yeah, I would, I would agree with that statement. Yes, yep. And as we're kicking off our new committees of council, we have our uh, development and tourism slash you know, community involvement one. We may have a few requests come from that kind of, those groups through that, that system. So uh, we could look at, at them. Okay. Excellent, so uh, staff has the direction on uh, item 10A for the community request for grants and donations. Uh, item number 11, any notices of motion? Discussions for further future council meetings? Seeing none, I have the ratification bylaw, that number 2023-16 being bylaw to adopt, confirm, ratify ma matters dealt with by resolution, be read and passed in open council, signed and sealed. Moved by Councillor Ward, seconded by Councillor Vino. All in favor? Carried. And motion for council to adjourn at the call of the chair. Oh, Councillor Smith. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, Councillor Ward. All in favor? So, as we conclude the uh, team meeting of the municipality of South Dundas for March 13th, I'd like to thank. Uh, all of those who attended tonight and our delegations, special thanks to the, our team, our team's working boots on the ground, parks, rec, fire, water, treasury, building, bylaw, communications, transportation, admin, customer service. And I'd also like to uh, announce and welcome a new member of our team. We have a new communications coordinator, Shauna O'Neill. So congratulations, Shauna. She is with us tonight in our first meeting. So welcome to South Dundas and uh, welcome to our team. And I'd like to thank all those that watched us tonight online or watch us as a future recording. Um, until our next meeting, which is Monday, March 27th, I'd like to say all those connected, we're super proud to uh, be here and